Shalom, shalom, and Shabbat shalom, everybody. It is the Ruach HaMet broadcast. We are here on lambnetwork.tv, messianiclamradio.com. And what a privilege it is to be with you today, to be able to, uh, to, uh, to give you, my brain got stuck there for a moment, the Word of God. And it is a delight that, uh, that we can be together, even if it's not in person, um, through the marvels of technology, to be able to gather together as Mishpacha's community. And so we want to bless each and every one of you uh, where you are. Today is a day where we need to be praying for Israel. They are on the highest alert uh, that they've been probably since the Yom Kippur War. And uh, things are getting really, really crazy over there. So let's remember to lift Israel up for God's protection and the destruction of her enemies. Um, I would even go so far as to say that uh, we should probably be looking at Psalm 83 once again as uh, Israel's enemies are rising up and surrounding her. But let's get right into uh, the, the word of God today. And um, we are going to... <clears throat> continue our study on the book of Revelation. So let's everybody rise for the blessing before the reading of the Torah portion. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher b'chabanu mikol hamim V'natan lanu et Torato Baruch atah Adonai Notein ha-Torah ha-Amen Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has <clears throat> chosen us from all peoples and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Our Torah reading today is from Parsha Shemini and 8th, and it will be from Leviticus chapter 10, from verses 1 to 7, by our recent Bar Mitzvah boy. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, for and before all the people I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. Then Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, "Come near, um, come near and carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp." So they went near and carried them by their tunics out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said to Aaron and to El Eliezer and Ith Ithamar, his sons, "Do not uncover your heads nor tear your clothes, lest you die." In wrath, in wrath come upon all the people, but let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord has kindled. You shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle, repeating, lest you die, for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. The re blessing after the reading of the Torah portion. Baruch Torah <clears throat> Baruch atah Adonai, notein ha-Torah ha-Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has given us the Torah of truth and planted life everlasting in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah, and the blessing before the reading of the Brit Chadashah, the New Covenant. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu Mashiach Yeshua, v'hadibrot shel chabrit hachadashah, Baruch atah Adonai, notein habrit achadashah ha 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 Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has given us Messiah Yeshua and the commandments of the new covenant. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the new covenant. Our brit chadashah reading is from Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her... Head, a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. And seven 
diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw him to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. May the Lord give increase to the reading of his word. The blessing after the reading of the Brit Chadashah portion. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam. Asher natan lanu hadavar haemet. V'chayu laham natah betochenu. Baruch atah Adonai notein habrit chadashah haamein. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has given us a word of truth and planted life everlasting in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the new covenant. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Off to production. Well, once again, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. And uh, we welcome you to the Ruach Hamet, the Spirit of Truth broadcast, where we give you the Word of God uh, without filter. I know sometimes that bothers people, but uh, I think we are living in an age where everybody wants the Word of God candy-coated so that they can feel good. And the Word of God is not supposed to make us feel good. The word of God is supposed to convict us, so we repent, so that we can feel good. Amen. I want to thank everybody for joining us last week for the Bar Mitzvah, those of you who are in person, those who attended online. Uh, it was a wonderful time had by all, and uh, God was glorified. Please continue to pray for those who are at the Bar Mitzvah who don't know the Lord yet. Uh, because the uh, there were some, and I do know that the message did impact some of them. So we give God thanks for that. So we bid Shabbat Shalom to all of you, to uh, Tony and Marilyn, Lawrence and Deb. We've got Bob and Cece. Uh, we've got Tony uh, Yosana. We've got <clears throat> um, we've got Joe Cameron. And we have Bob and Carol and Daniel and Yosan, many others. And I want to thank everybody for joining us. We bid you shalom wherever you might be here in Canada, the U.S., and all over the world. <clears throat> On September 23rd, 2017, the sun was supposed to be in the constellation Virgo, which is the Virgin, along with the moon near uh, Virgo's feet. And additionally, Jupiter was to be in Virgo, while the planets Venus, Mars, and Mercury were to be above and to the right of Virgo in the constellation Leo. Some people claim that it was a very rare event, allegedly only once in every 7,000 years. And there was a lot of twittering that was going on in the prophetic realm. It was one of the most... Uh, um, talked about celestial events and everybody thought that this was going to be the um <clears throat> uh the, the the coming of Yeshua and there were all kinds of wild theories uh it was kind of like squirrels in traffic that was going on at the time if you started reading uh, it turned out that this event wasn't quite as rare as everybody made it out to be it also um what they were saying about the uniqueness of this wasn't the case. It wasn't only nine plan, uh, nine um, stars and then a couple of planets that made 12 that made the garland. There were actually more. So the, the, the point of all this is that what we are here talking about today is one of the most studied sections of the book of Revelation. And there's been some pretty crazy things that are talked about. Now, we do have, of course, that God has put things into the heavenlies for our benefit. Um, 
Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14, and it says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, or moedims, and for days and years. So that word seasons isn't the, the seasons of the years, uh, like, you know, the winter, spring, summer, fall, but rather the appointed times of the Lord. So God has put the sun, the moon, and the stars the celestial um, objects for our benefit to give us signs, to help us to understand. But we, we need not get too caught up in it because if we start trying to interpret it, you can get very easily, you can make the transition from astronomy, the study of the stars, to astrology, which is attaching spiritual influence to it. You know, there are people who read their horoscopes all the time because depending on what what sign that you're under uh, will determine your fate. Well, that's that's pretty silly when you think about it. Because I tell people, well, then you might as well go ask your future of the fireplace because the stars are nothing but big balls of fire. But <clears throat> because the people of the ancient world and many still today worship the stars because they believe that they're gods, and yes, there are spirits that are behind them, then you can get into some very dicey territory. So we've got to be really careful about this. You know, prophecy, when it comes to predicting what is to come, is it's, it's an area that we need to approach with caution. Uh, we've got some monumental things that are lining up to happen on Monday uh, with regards to the coming solar eclipse. And if you've listened to some of the stuff that's out there, it's truly phenomenal what's happening. And I do believe that there's a lot that is being said in this uh, particular eclipse. I do believe that God is definitely trying to send a message to the United States as around as with the rest of the world. We've got um, uh, <laughs> there, there are some things that are happening. If you look at Iran right now, there are a lot of things that are happening. There was a meteor shower and there are some other things that are going on that would appear that God is warning Iran, don't do something stupid. Now, of course, human kinds uh, propensity is to ignore those things and much to its own chagrin. But God is warning us. But at the same time, we have to be careful and we have to kind of draw back the, the excitement and say, well, this is going to be. Because if you say, well, this is definitely going to happen, and it doesn't, you end up looking like a fool. But more importantly, when it comes to the word of God, <clears throat> you become a false prophet. And God is not pleased with those who trifle with his word like that, especially if it's for their own benefit. And why do people um, prophesy falsely? It's for some sort of personal gain, whether it's recognition, whether it's money, it's to be seen as some, it, whatever it is, it's a selfish reason. So we got to be extra careful about setting dates and saying that, you know, this is going to happen. I can tell you what's going to happen because when it's written in the word of God, but I don't necessarily know when it's going to happen. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 2, thus says the Lord, do not learn the way of the nations and do not be terrified by the signs of heaven. Although the nations are terrified by them. And, and then he goes on to talk about the, uh, the, Christ, you know, the, the, the tree that they would set up and decorate with gold and silver, which would be our Christmas tree today. He says, don't do that. These are idols. Daniel chapter 6, verse 27, where King Darius says, after uh, Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den and survives, he delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So we acknowledge that God has authority over these things. What is the purpose of signs? 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 22 tells us, so then tongues are for a sign, not to, um, 
not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. So speaking in a foreign tongue, I'm not talking about your personal prayer language. If you speak in tongues and you're doing it in a public setting and there's no interpretation, it's mindless babbling. What Paul is dealing with here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is a known language. And so if I was in if I was in China, for instance, and I all of a sudden started speaking perfect Mandarin, which is very hard to do, by the way, then um, and someone was able to understand it and I was proclaiming the word of God, then that would be a sign to the unbeliever. How is this guy? I mean, that's what happened on, on Shavuot, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was given, everybody started talking in a language that these other people knew and understand. It's like, well, how are they doing this? It's because of the power of God. So it's assigned to the unbeliever. However, what Paul also says is, but prophecy is for a sign, not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. And when we talk about prophecy, we're not talking about predicting the future, although that's an element of prophecy. The totality of prophecy is speaking forth the word of God. And so when I proclaim to you that the message of the entire Bible is repent and be saved from this perverse generation, that is prophesying to you. That is saying, return from your wicked ways. If I say to you that God is offended by pagan holidays, I am prophesying to you. I'm not saying what's going to happen. I can tell you it's not going to be good. But I'm not, you know, giving you a prediction that if you don't do this, I'm not saying to 40 days and Seattle will be overthrown like Jonah did with Nineveh. I'm not saying that. But Seattle will eventually be overthrown, as will Toronto, as will New York, as will California. And anybody who doesn't adhere and submit themselves to the word of God and be obedient. So... The, the these these signs are for unbelievers. We don't need signs in heaven to know what's going on. We don't need an eclipse. The eclipse that is coming is not for us because we already know what's going to happen. That's why we're going through the book of Revelation here. I've already told you over the past five, six months what is going to be happening. I told you there's going to be a demonic horde coming out of the pit. And as they're getting ready to fire up CERN, on, on Monday, they're the ones who might even end up doing it. If this if this thing actually works to what they are trying to do, they're trying to rip open the dimensional door with this thing. They want these entities that are on the other side to be able to come through. They want to be able to send other people on the other side, which they're not going to be able to do. And very well, it might be the hubris of mankind that releases the demonic horde that is going to torment people and eventually kill people. Wouldn't that be irony? I don't need signs in heaven. I don't need a big X to go across the United States, the, the, the Tav and, and, and all these things, because we've got a more sure, according to Peter, a more sure word of prophecy. We've got the Bible. I don't need some prophet to stand up and say, oh, you know, my people, I love you. Yeah, I know that. I don't need someone prophesying to tell me that. I need to be reminded from the word of God. So we need to be real careful about what we're doing with this. But signs, the celestial bodies, the earth, uh, the, the sun, the moon, the stars, comets, meteors, all of those things are supposed to be for the benefit of the unbeliever. When you have a play or a movie, you always get the cast that is given to you at the beginning, or in the case of a play, it'll be on the program, and then, of course, at the end. The longest-running um, play on Broadway or musical so far is Phantom of the Opera. It's been going since 1988, 36 years and running. But what we have here in Revelation chapter 12 is actually a a drama that's been going on for 6,000 years since Genesis 1-2, when the earth became formless and void. And when you had Lucifer's rebellion against God, 
and God recreated the earth and he planted man on earth and he created the, um, the heavens and the earth and he created the animals, he created the fish, created the birds of the air, created man, put him in the garden, man fell. And we've got this ongoing drama that's been that's been happening for 6,000 years now. <clears throat> and Revelation 12 is the program. So, you know, you've got all this stuff that's going on. And so you've had the, the seven trumpets. And we're kind of in the middle of the seven trumpet now. It's not something that happens and then boom, right away that we, we have the, the response to that. Um, here you have another interlude. Here you have another, okay, we've been focusing on this. Now we're going to turn and we're going to focus on this. And a lot of what goes on in Revelation chapter 12 is past. I was listening to one podcast about, you know, what Revelation uh, 12 was really all about. And then someone, the guy started to get into some, you know, this was all about Donald Trump and George. So I was like, oh, okay, here we go. Here we go. Um, that may be a, you may be able to interpret it to a degree as to who's influencing these events. But the reality is that a lot of what's happened here in Revelation 12 has already occurred. But there's still a part that needs to happen. And so what Revelation 12 does, it's the program. It is telling us who the main actors are in this cosmic drama that we've got between what is essentially good and evil. It's, it's you know, is it a love story? Well, it is when we show that God loves us and he's fighting for us. Thayer's Greek definition says the word sign comes from the Greek word sermion meaning a sign, a mark, a token, an unusual occurrence, transcending the common course of nature. So that's what all of these things that are going on in the, in the heavenlies, that's what this eclipse is all about. That's what comets are all about. That's what the, the, the constellations are all about. That's what the sun coming up in the morning and setting at night and, and, and the moon going around the earth, that's what all these things are. It is a sign for us because first and foremost, the heavens declare the glory of God. Psalm chapter 19. The heavens speak. Romans chapter 1, same thing. Why is it that God will be able to judge every single person all throughout history, no matter where they were, whether they were to hear the gospel or not, when it comes time to the, uh, the day of judgment? Because creation speaks to God. Creation speaks to a creator. And we must cling fast to him. Can't tell you how many testimonies we've had about someone in the middle of the bush and somewhere in you know this primitive country kind of looking up and saying, Someone must have created all this. I want to know who it is. And bang, that's when God shows up. We have to want to. We have to want to know who this creator is. But God gives us signs. If you look at the 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 hydro cycle, you look at the water cycle. And how you have evaporation, and you have the rain clouds and rains, and then you've got the rivers and everything else. That's a cycle. That happened all by accident? Absurd. No, 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 no. No, that shows that there was a designer who designed all of this. And if you seek out, if you say in your heart, I want to know who this is, God will move heaven and earth. He'll send a missionary. He'll drop a Bible out of the sky. He'll give you divine revelation. Helen Keller, the the deaf and and uh, blind girl. I mean, how do you how do you communicate with someone who's deaf and blind? And yet, someone was able to do that. And her teacher was a Christian. And then, when she was finally able to communicate with her after working with her for several years, she says, "I want to tell you about Yeshua." And Helen Keller said, "Oh, I already know about him." Well, how on earth did she find out about him? Because God supernaturally revealed himself because she wanted to know. <clears throat> when we get to Revelation chapter 12, when we see this cast of characters, the central figure is not who we might think. 
It is not Yeshua. He's almost like a side note in this when you look at it. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and pain to give birth. And so then you had a, another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, the great fiery dragging, having seven heads and, and ten hordes and seven di uh, diadems on his head. Okay, and, and he was about to devour the child. So she bore the male child who was to rule all nations. But the child was caught up to God on his throne. He disappears. He's out of the scene now. So the central character in all of this is the woman. And so who is she? Some say it's the church. And that the church uh, birthed the, uh, the, the kingdom of God. I've read so many uh, commentaries on stuff like this. And when it should be obvious to anybody who looks at this who the woman is. She's got a garland of 12 stars above her head. Hmm. Where did that come from? This is reminiscent, of course, and a fulfillment of Joseph's dream. Joseph had a dream where the sun and the moon and 11 stars bow down to him. The sun representing jo uh, Jacob, the moon representing his mother, even though she had already passed by then. And then his 11 brothers would all bow down to him. So this woman has the 12 stars about her head. She is national Israel. And Israel gave birth to the child, of course, Yeshua. Well, how do we know that? Well, he's going to rule the, the world with a rod of iron. We see that from Isaiah chapter 11. As a matter of fact, we can go right to that. Isaiah 11 says that there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow from his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall be upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor decide with equity for the meek of the earth, he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. The word of God is going to come out of his mouth and he's going to judge the earth. We go to Psalm chapter 2. Again, another fulfillment. God, The, the Father says to Yeshua in verse 8, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. So it's quite clearly that this child, who is to rule all nations with the rod of iron, is Yeshua. And of course, after his resurrection, he ascended to heaven. He's with the Father. But you've got the woman who's still left now. So, you, you've got this woman who becomes the central focus, and this is what's making everybody crazy. Why do you think that Iran is looking to destroy Israel right now? Why is it that it is constantly funding these terrorist activities? I mean, they've spent billions of dollars on the Houthis and on the on Hezbollah, on the on Hamas, Islamic Jihad, that almost all comes from Iran. What, why is all this? Because you've got the Prince of Persia that Daniel talked about that's still murderously trying to destroy Israel. Remember, our, our battle is not against flesh and blood. We're not fighting against these terrorists. We're fighting against the spirits behind them. Our weapons of warfare are not carnal, they're not fleshly, but divinely inspired for tearing down strongholds. Well, how do we tear down strongholds? We repent. 
And then we take the authority that has been given to us and we come against those demonic attacks. Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 2 says that a curse unfounded cannot land. When we walk in to see, and how do we, how is a curse founded when there's sin? That's what happened with Nadab and Abihu in the Torah portion today. They sinned and judgment came in. But when we are repentant, and that's the word of every prophetic voice throughout a true prophetic voice. Not that God wants to make you feel good. God wants to make you feel wretched about your sin so that you repent and then you become good. There's a big difference. And Israel is in the it, it is the center of all this because God used Israel. Israel was God's instrument of judgment against the nations in a wicked world. And that's why Israel's hated so much. How is it that after October 7th, that so many protests against Israel's war against Hamas, which they started, where they murdered mercilessly, brutally, over 1,200 people, beheaded and murdered babies, cooked them alive in ovens, unprecedented. How is it that the world has now risen up and said that we condemn Israel for this? And that the, the, the fools in U.S. government are telling Israel, you can't defend yourself. Why? Because it's a spiritual war. <clears throat> it's a spiritual war. And ultimately, anti-Semitism is a tool of the devil in order to take out God's covenant nation, and that is Israel, and that is the woman that we find here in Revelation chapter 12. Insanity. It doesn't make any sense, but spiritual things don't make any sense. And the, the, the woman in Revelation 12, Israel, is a contrast to another woman in the book of Revelation, which is the whore of Babylon. And this woman is righteous, whereas the whore of Babylon is entirely the opposite. So Revelation is a contrast between the two women, the world system versus Israel and God's empowering of her. Hosea chapter 2 is all about Israel's idolatry that she fell into prostitution. But verses 23, uh, 14 through 23 of Hosea 2 is all about her return and God's redemption of her. That was Hosea's job. Hosea chapter 2 is a beautiful book. or Hosea, The whole book of Hosea is a beautiful book about God's Relentless pursuit of Israel, her unfaithfulness, but God's redemption of her. And in many ways, that's the church today, because the church is part of the commonwealth of Israel. The church has been every bit as unfaithful to God as Israel. We won't even get started on that, because that could be another uh, 75 uh, messages. So the sun above her head is God's light. It represents male headship. It is glory. Um, Yeshua is called the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness. And that there is healing in his wings. While the moon under her feet reflects the light. So that is the female. So the, the sun is often referred to um, the masculine side of, of uh, things. And then the female is the moon. The moon is under her feet because it's submission to male headship. But also, the moon represents the calendar because the, the entire Jewish calendar, the entire Hebrew calendar is based on the moon cycle. That's why we're to have a celebration on the new moon. That's why on Monday we have the, the biblical new year. Because it is a, a new moon. <clears throat> and it also, the moon refers to 
worship. And the stars, I think, you know, quite clearly represent the tribes of Israel so that we know exactly who this is. You know, people say, well, you know, the, the woman is the church. The church did not give birth to the Messiah. <laughs> the Messiah gave birth to the church. And the stars are not the apostles. Now, you can say that there is a, a contrast between them or that the apostles kind of represent the 12 tribes. But no, that's not what this is all about. The woman is Israel, and there was a war going on here. So it says that there was a, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Well, we have the physical labor, of course, a woman giving birth. That was one of the curses of the fall, that a woman would give birth uh, to children in pain. But it's also a reference to the, the difficult circumstances under which Yeshua was born. You know, she, um, we have the virgin birth. Well, if you, you, if you stop and think about it, you know how much ridicule and shame that there was with this whole thing? I mean, to, at the end of Yeshua's life, when he's debating with the religious leaders, they're essentially calling him a bastard. They're saying, you're an, you're, you're the very, means by which you came into the world is illegitimate. Your mother was like Gomer and Hosea. She slept around because we all know that Joseph isn't really your father. There was shame. Joseph wanted to put her away. It was a very difficult time for both Joseph and now. He was a righteous man and he took her he realized this was of God. But look how God brought the Messiah into the world. There was, there was shame. There was no room for them. When, when they came into Bethlehem, it says there's no room for the inn, but that's, that's not, you know, inn is not a proper translation. It's the upper room. It's the place where guests would have stayed. There was no room for them there at the time. Because... You give a place of honor. They weren't going to give honor to Joseph and Mary because there was shame involved. Because what they thought was that she had had a child. She had gotten pregnant outside of, uh, of wedlock and that it was through another man. So the, the, when she's crying out in pain here of labor, it's the difficult circumstances, but also Israel is giving birth to Messiah under very, very difficult times in Israel's history. They're under the boot of the Roman occupation. Israel is in a horror. I mean, why was there such a great messianic fervor at the time? Because the rule of Rome was hard. There were people being crucified all the time. Taxation was heavy. It's kind of like our time right now. The government was no friend of Israel. And Israel, <clears throat> Israel was being disciplined by God. So we have a woman, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. A lot of what, you know, the, the people of Israel were saying, well, now are you going to restore the, the kingdom? That was what they asked Yeshua right before he ascended. Okay, can we, you know, why did they why did the Jewish leadership reject Yeshua as Messiah? Because he didn't he didn't overthrow the Roman overlords. He's gonna do that eventually. But it was difficult. And then you have another sign that appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven uh, diadems on his head. The dragon, and there, there's no question about who it is, the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth. Who is this dragon? In verse 9, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, Satan, Hasatan, the, the, the prosecutor, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, 
and his angels were cast out with him. So when it says that he took a third of the stars of heaven with him, it's talking about angels. We see that in Job chapter 38 and verse 7. Uh, that um, it says, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So this great dragon, and interestingly enough, um, in the Garden of Eden, we have the Nahash, the serpent, but it also means burning one. And so there's debate as to whether the Nahash in the garden was Lucifer, whether it was Halel, which is his Hebrew name, shining one, or whether it's another fallen angel that actually deceived Adam and Eve because Lucifer is an anointed cherub, according to um, Isaiah 14 and, and Ezekiel 28. But the, and, and there's a distinction between the cherubim and the seraphim. They're two different classes of angels. But we also see them intermingling and overlapping. So the, the burning one in Genesis 1 or Genesis chapter 3, the serpent in the garden, could have been a fiery serpent. But what we do know is that we have Satan depicted all over the world. You have the, the winged serpent god of the Aztecs in Mexico, Quetzalcoatl. And many times throughout history, he has been depicted as such. And so it says here that he, um, uh, he stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour the child as soon as it was born. Well, what is that referring to? Well, obviously, that's referring to Herod. I can remember when when my son was uh, was being born and we were in the hospital and, you know, my wife was she was just getting ready. And I was kind of standing there like this. It was almost like I had my catcher's mitt. It was like, come on, boy, come on out. I, I was ready. That's when the uh, the nurse said, well, if you have to sit down, then, uh, you know, feel free. I said, well, why would I do that? She says, oh, you have no idea how many men faint. <laughs> I wasn't fainting, but you can almost see like the dragon was just standing there waiting for Yeshua to be born. And Herod sends the people, you know, he, 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 what do you mean there's a king of Israel? I'm the king of Israel. And so he's, um, he's, he uh, tells the, uh, the, the Magi, the wise men who came from Babylon, there was a, probably a whole bunch of, there was more than three. I'm just saying, and there's probably, uh, they all go and he says, well, uh, he he tells them, well, you know, you tell me where he is so that I can go worship him too. And then God tells them to go another way. And so what does Herod do? He sends his soldiers and they wipe out every child under two years old in Jerusalem, or in Bethlehem, rather. He was ready to kill the child because he wasn't going to have any usurper. He was the king of Israel. Not in God's economy. Sorry, Herod. So anyway, they run off to Egypt, and then Yeshua dies. He rises from the dead. He ascends to heaven. <clears throat> and the dragon now turns his attention. The seven diadems on the diadems on his head <clears throat> represent crowns. So it could be nations that he rules. Um, what's interesting is that Tiamat is the Mesopotamian goddess associated with primordial chaos and the salt sea, best known for the Babylonian epic Amuna Elish. In all versions of the myth, following the original, Tiamat always symbolizes the forces of chaos, which threatens the order established by the gods. And she was often depicted with either five or seven heads. So we again have in pagan mythology a representation of what we see here in the scriptures. Satan has made himself known to many, and he's taken his, his guys with him. So he takes a third of the stars, and that's clearly the angels, as I, I already read for you, Job 37, uh, 38 and verse 7, but he says that um, 
and then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon uh, and the dragon and his angels. So we have a third of the angels. This is where you get spiritual warfare from. Is that Lucifer, the light bearer, Hallel, the shining one, if you want to use his Hebrew name, he convinced a third of the angels to rebel with him. That is where all of spiritual warfare comes from. Because then when you have, <clears throat> if it was just him, it wouldn't be a problem. But he's got an army with him. And he took a third of the angels. We don't know how many angels there are. There could be millions. There could be, we don't know. And what we have is this cosmic battle. So you have, according to the book of Enoch, 200 of these fallen angels descended upon Mount Hermon. And then they decided that they were going to rebel against God, go against the uh, the order of things, and say that we are not, or, or we're going to breed with, with uh, humankind. And they said, we're going to commit this great sin. So you have the Nephilim, you have the giants. And this is interesting, in the news lately, they're starting to come up with all kinds of graves and things like that of, of giants that's starting to make the news. They hid this stuff before. They didn't want anybody to know it. It's now all coming out. And so then God floods the world because of the corruption of the DNA of man. But it says in the book of Enoch that you now have these dispossessed spirits of the Nephilim that are wandering the earth. These are the demons that we fight against today. So Satan takes a third of the angels with them, untold numbers. They create their own offspring, the Nephilim. And then when God destroys the Nephilim, now you've got these dispossessed spirits and you wonder why there's so much craziness going on in the world today. This Here you have the most unbelievable, incredible, profound drama in all of history. And we are right in the center of it in the last days, right before all this thing wraps up. We will be the final generation, no doubt. I, I can't see this going on for too much longer. I could be wrong. I'm not date setting. <laughs> but, I mean, my goodness. <clears throat> so the woman flees into the wilderness. She bore the male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Her child was caught up to God and his throne. So Yeshua is now sitting at the right hand of the father. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God and they should feed her there 1,260 days. So again, you have this number of 42 months or three and a half years. The Great Tribulation Period. <clears throat> These are called Jacob's Troubles. These are called, there's a difference between the Tribulation, which is the seven-year covenant that the Antichrist makes, and the Great Tribulation, which is the final three and a half years. This is when Satan turns and deals with Israel, because I believe that the church is taken out of the way. I still subscribe to around a mid-trib rapture. I could be wrong about that. But that's kind of where I think that things happen. But it's quite clear here that with Yeshua now being taken out of the way, that the dragon is now going after mum, Israel. And that's what you see happening in the world. That's where all this anti-Semitism, which is completely irrational, is coming from. You have the left that demand women's rights, except when it comes to Israeli women being raped and murdered. Then they don't have rights. So the, the Israel goes into the wilderness for God's protection. The wilderness is not a place in this particular case of um, judgment. It's God's provision and protection. He had manna in the desert for them for 40 years. Yes, they were being disciplined because they weren't obedient, but God still took care of them. Their clothes didn't even wear out for 40 years. 
Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 20 says, Come, my people, enter into your rooms, close your doors behind you, hide for a little while until indignation runs its course before, before behold, the Lord is about to come out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth. There's that expression again for their iniquity and the earth will reveal her bloodshed and will no longer cover her slain. Everything hidden is going to be revealed. And we see that happening here in the final three and a half years. Now, we always we have to remember that doesn't mean that Israel is going to be without persecution and that there she's going to be completely safe because we also know that in Zechariah chapter 13a it says strike the sheep and uh, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter and then you have God saying that two thirds will be cut off but one third will be brought through as by fire. Two-thirds of the nation of Israel are going to die in the coming Holocaust under the reign of the Antichrist. But one-third will be brought through by fire. One-third will, at the end of the seven and a half years, or the seven years rather, look up and they'll see Yeshua coming. And it says, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced and mourn as one mourns for an only son. But God is not going to allow Israel to be destroyed. And so when we talk about God's protection, when we talk about God's provision, that doesn't mean that it's we're on easy street. That doesn't mean that there isn't persecution, that there isn't tribulation, that there isn't difficulty. What it means is that the enemy is not going to succeed in his ultimate desire to wipe us all out. There's been much speculation as to where this hiding place is going to be. Uh, many have said Petra, which is in Jordan. Daniel chapter 11, verse 41 says that Edom, Moab, and the sons of Ammon will resist the Antichrist. So not every nation is going to follow the Antichrist, and Israel is going to be able to run to a place that isn't in alignment with him. It's kind of like Bulgaria during World War II. The, Bulgarians, uh, the Bulgarian king, Boris, refused to hand the Jews over. Not one Jewish person in Bulgaria died during World War II. Boris ended up giving his life for it. He was poisoned. But the Jews were protected. And so this is going to be another hiding place for Israel during the Great Tribulation period. And she has a place prepared that God should feed her there 1260 days and then finally we have michael who's the fourth character and war broke out in heaven michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought but they did not prevail nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer so the great dragon was cast out that serpent of old called the devil and satan who deceives the whole earth he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with them the second heaven gets cleared out Michael, who is the opposite of Satan. Yeshua is not the opposite of Satan. God does not have an opposite. Michael is the opposite of Satan. He is his counter. If the two of them were to get into the ring, it might be, you know, a, um, a split decision. They're pretty close. Except that Michael has two thirds of the angels. Satan only has one. And so God cleans out the second heaven. Where do they land? They land on earth, and this is where the problems really begin for the inhabitants of the earth. And we'll get into that next week. Nadab and Abihu died because they transgressed God's covenant. Judgment came down swiftly. This production, this play, this drama that is going on is a culmination of all the rebellion that has ever happened against God. And judgment is coming upon the earth. <clears throat> now that we know the characters, we have a much better understanding of this battle. And so we need to ask God for wisdom on what to do. Because with Iran threatening to strike Israel, we see this playing out right before our very eyes. So, Father, 
as all of these things are coming upon us with the, the, the eclipse and the new year and Passover coming up, war and rumors of wars and earthquakes and everything else that's happening, Father, we pray that the world would receive the warning that is coming and would repent. Father, the gospel is not about you giving us wonderful things here on earth. It's not about being rich. It's not about being wealthy. It's not about being healthy. It's about repenting and making sure that we're right with you so that whatever may befall us, including tribulation and even death, we know that we will be with you. Because eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, nor has the heart discerned the things that are in store for those who love God. We pray all these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, if the message was a blessing to you, we ask that you would give it a like, a thumbs up. We pray that you would share it, leave your comments. We also continue to ask that you would, uh, if God lays it upon your heart to contribute financially to this ministry, that we may con that we may continue to bring you the unadulterated and unfiltered word of God so that we're not tickling your ears, as Bob said. <clears throat> And you can go to alttnmessianic.com. We're going to be setting up actually a, a new uh, donation system this week so that we can um, take uh, different types of payments. Brothers and sisters, receive your benediction. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and the son saying, this is how you shall bless the children of Israel. You shall say unto them, you hear your weapon of a lack of a yukon, eh? Yes, ha 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 ha, yawe, on a way to hecha, by a sem laha, shan lo ho 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 ho. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you, give you his shalom. And they shall invoke my name upon the children of Israel, and I shall bless them. <laughs> Shabbat shalom, everybody. And just remember, tomorrow at 11 a.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time, you can see the threshing floor new show with uh, Leone Johnson and myself. Shabbat shalom, everybody. We'll see you soon. We are richly blessed to bring you what we believe is the fullest, most diverse, yet up-to-date progressive teachings, discussion, and prayer programming you can find anywhere on this planet. Be sure to take the tour of the MessianicLambRadio.com website. I'm Susan Hoogie, thanking you for joining us on the Messianic Lamb Video Network. <laughs>